when uh, one starts talking about history, one realizes that it's uh, fraught with potential dangers. Number one, fuzzy memory. And in talking with different people, I see that we all have fuzzy memories, and the fuzzy memories don't always agree with each other. So, and the other fact, uh, when you start wanting to talk about, or you start remembering what happened over the years, you realize that some of the funniest and most interesting stories you still can't tell in public. Uh, like the time when, uh, you know, computer terminals were in short supply, and uh, one pre-doc allegedly hauled off and hit another pre-doc, and uh, Alex and I had to serve as judge and jury uh, <laughs> arbitrating this uh, discussion. Right. Um, yes, there were things we never imagined having to, <laughs> to deal with. So before ITAMP, there was TAMOC. And uh, I certainly do remember that first meeting of TAMOC at the store's DEAP meeting uh, in 1984 because, uh, number one, the torrential rains. Um, it was absolutely, I mean, I was sopping wet for the entire three days. And then the other was I had considerable trepidation because at that meeting I was taking over as secretary treasurer of the division of electron and atomic physics um, from Pat Damer, a formidable uh, person to uh, fill her shoes. And uh, so I was anticipating a huge amount of work. Um, but I know I did attend the TAMOC meeting. In 1985, uh, I had just had my fourth child, and um, so I brought him with me to the, uh, I think it was DAMOP then, it, it sort of had this transition between DEAP and DAMOP, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. And um, uh, he was, as I say, three months old, and I'm quite sure I attended the TAMOC meeting, but I have to say I really don't remember. I was probably sleep deprived. Um, and uh, so there, it was really great to hear from, uh, from Dick Pratt um, about a lot of the early history because I don't remember too much um, uh, from about 85 to 87, um, but as various proposals uh, for the theoretical institutes at other institutions um, materialized over the next several years, uh, in response to the concerns about the shortage of AMO theorists, I remember encouraging Alex most enthusiastically to submit a proposal. Because in a way, uh, a proposal uh, for an, an institute would formalize what actually already existed in our group, in the theoretical atomic and molecular physics group at Harvard Smithsonian. Um, we always had a large number of postdocs working on a number of projects uh, and also a constant stream of visitors, um, especially in the summer, many of whom were former students and postdocs and collaborators with Alex and, and all of us. So the original proposal uh, was submitted, uh, as Dick said, on the SAO side. Um, number one, because its overhead was a lot more favorable um, than the, uh, the Harvard side, and we knew that the program funds were limited. And um, also, it probably, there was some interest on the part of Erwin Shapiro, uh, the CFA director at the time, and I don't see him in the audience, so I'm free to say it, but uh, who I think would wanted to press the point a bit that SAO there should be some precedent established for SAO receiving uh, NSF uh, funds. Well, ultimately, as you've heard from Dick, there was a problem and, and we uh, had a compromise and uh, the final decision was to propose half of the program on the Harvard side and the other half of the program that is funding the visitors and the postdocs on the Smithsonian side which was run through our Office of Fellowships and Grants and didn't carry any overhead at all. So that really helped uh, further the uh, program funds a bit available from NSF. And actually, we still continue to maintain that kind of split today, always trying to um, minimize the amount of overhead we're uh, paying. Um, 
Now, the purposes of the um, institute, as uh, stated in the first proposal, as Dick said, were attracting and training the highest quality graduate students in atomic and molecular um, theory, maintaining an active visitors program to bring people together for varying lengths of time for scientific collaborations and establishing a strong postdoctoral fellowship program. And the proposal, as we all have heard, was funded in, uh, no, or was funded in November uh, 1988. And um, Alex served as ITAMP's director for the critical first five years of ITAMP's existence. And I think that really um, established ITAMP on such a firm footing. Um, a prominent goal in the first proposal was to be the appointment of this senior uh, atomic and molecular theorist to an SAO funded position with a professorial appointment uh, in the Harvard Physics Department and Alex had the unenviable task of organizing and chairing the search committee for this uh, position. Um, not being a member of the Harvard Physics faculty. And I think that was an amazing challenge. Uh, at the time, also, there were very few AMO physicists in the Harvard Physics Department. Um, Roy Glauber, uh, Jerry Gabriels had only recently come, Frank Pipkin, and Tim Chupp, who was an assistant professor at the time. Uh, and Norman Ramsey had actually retired in 86. Well, we've heard that it was a lengthy process, and uh, the first offer was declined. Um, but uh, uh, the committee and Alex persisted, and I think this was really uh, essential. And um, we were extremely fortunate to be able to hire uh, Rick Heller from the University of Washington, who took over um, as planned as ITAMP director uh, in the fall of 93 and immediately attracted a large uh, number of grad students to his group from the Harvard Physics Department. And I really think there were a number of young people there thirsting for some um, uh, atomic theory. So this was a wonderful uh, event. Now I want to focus sort of on the, the evolution of ITAMP uh, because um, uh, it's, it's, it started uh, 20 years ago, but it's definitely evolved as, of course, AMO physics has also evolved. And um, I think its evolution has been quite remarkable. And many of its most positive aspects bear the thumbprint of its creator, Alex Delgarno. For instance, reflecting the breadth of research interest that's always been a prominent part of Alex's research portfolio and the Delgarno uh, legacy, ITAMP prides itself on featuring a broad spectrum of research in its workshops and in bringing together diverse communities within and, uh, within and outside of AMO physics. And these communities have come from, of course, astrophysics, very naturally. Um, in fact, we just had a, a very interesting um, workshop in March, Atomic and Molecular Physics of the Early Universe, where we brought cosmologists, astronomers, and AMO physicists together. Uh, condensed matter physics, quantum information science, medical physics, nuclear physics, theoretical chemistry, mesoscopic physics, the list goes on. And it's really, I think, uh, um, made the place very exciting and I think has stimulated a lot of very interesting uh, AMO physics throughout the years. ITAMP has always been about its people. We have had a succession of exceptional ITAMP funded postdocs and ITAMP associated postdocs, each contributing to the intellectual vitality of the Institute, starting with the first ITAMP postdoc, Jim Babb, uh, who got his PhD with Larry Spruck and is now a research physicist at SAO and ITAMP scientist. Close to the same time, Hossein Sadapur came. And he is now also a research physicist at SAO, ITAMP scientist, and uh, head of the visitor program at ITAMP. And Misha Lukin, 
who was an ITAM postdoc in 1998 to 2001, when he was appointed to an assistant professorship in the Harvard Physics Department, and then subsequently, three years later, to a tenured full professorship at Harvard. And um, then uh, it was stated by Barry, I think, that, that he was uh, appointed co-director. In fact, we all asked Misha to become director of ITAMP and, uh, because I had been director long enough and uh, um, he's a very busy person and actually he um, said he would do it if I would co-direct it with him. So <laughs> I felt that his involvement was, with ITAMP was essential and so I reluctantly agreed to um, stay on but in a co-director position. Our postdocs have gone on to take research and teaching positions at outstanding institutions, um, both academic and, and um, uh, national lab uh, situations around the world. So we have people, ITAMP postdocs at uh, ETH in Zurich, University of Copenhagen, CNRS in France, um, Max Planck Institute in Dresden, University of British Columbia, University of the Negev in Israel, Los Alamos National Lab, Argonne National Lab, and adjunct professor at University of Chicago, University of Connecticut, Temple University, University of Montana, Jilla and the University of Colorado, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Reno, Kansas State University, Penn State University, and I'm sure I've actually missed some. So it's just it's really uh, uh, impressive. And the wonderful thing about our ITAMP postdocs is that they come back and visit. And, uh, and they organize workshops. And they've become a vital part of the AMO theory community, which Alex helped to establish. Now I just wanted to show you a few more things about uh, ITAMP's uh, evolution. Um, just to show you the uh, ITAMP scientists and staff uh, start, starting in uh, 88 um, or 89, uh, Brendan McLaughlin was hired as computer specialist. And we had an ITAMP administrative assistant and Val Sorensen was division administrator. And now today, ITAMP scientists and staff. Um, there are a number of us, and uh, I won't read aloud all the names, but you can see we have um, a number of people uh, who contribute to the intellectual vitality of ITAMP, uh, in, and that doesn't even list our postdocs and students, etc. Now, the workshops were not a central uh, part of our proposal uh, in, in 88, and I don't know why I'm saying our proposal. In fact, it was Alex's proposal. He totally wrote it uh, himself, no help um, from his uh, colleagues. But uh, the, um, so over the first five years, we had seven, work, uh, seven workshops, and I point out just a few of them here. Uh, the first workshop we ever had was uh, on coupled cluster theory at the interface of atomic physics and quantum chemistry uh, that or was organized by Ron, Rod Bartlett and Das. Then um, another workshop, which I mentioned because Dick Pratt was involved in organizing it, was on emission and absorption of radiation by structured particles. And then we had a real first, I think the first meeting on cold atom or ultra cold atom physics uh, here in the US, uh, cold atom collisions workshop organized by Yehuda Band and Paul Julian in uh, April of 1992, three years before uh, the announcement of uh, B BEC in the laboratory. And then um, a workshop that was notable for a huge snowstorm and also, one, one of its organizers is here at the meeting, um, Franco Gianturco, the comparative study of current methodologies in electron molecule scattering. And I think we had a record snowstorm um, during the last day of the workshop. Yeah, you guys were both there. <laughs> and 
it, it was really three feet of snow. They banned driving in Cambridge. And I remember, you know, slogging through the snow, uh, offering people some meals at my house because <laughs> nobody could get out. And uh, how long did it take you, Barry, to, to get home? Three days, yeah, after the workshop. OK, well, it was impressive. Um, so that, as I say, seven workshops in the first five years. And now this is a list of our workshops just this year. And uh, it doesn't even include a topical group that we're having in um, uh, October on, um, uh, let's see, what was it? Hmm. Um, oh, yeah, adiabatic quantum computing, October 6th to 17th. And uh, I couldn't fit it on the slide. But this, the workshops, I think, have been incredible success. And also a very good way of really featuring um, theory in conjunction with experiment. And I think that is tremendously to the um, benefit of theory and the opportunity for our experimentalist colleagues to appreciate um, the contributions theory makes in pushing forward uh, a um, understanding. So here are the ITAMP programs at this point. Um, Barry mentioned the Joint Atomic Physics Colloquia, which have been going for the last uh, 20 years now. And um, the Cambridge Area AMO Physics Open Houses, which I think we started somewhere in the late 90s. And um, we've had periodically, sometimes in conjunction with the C Center for Ultra Cold Atoms, sometimes um, in conjunction with the University of Connecticut. And then just recently, in April, we had a big one that brought together um, well, the CUA, ITAMP, University of Connecticut, Yale, BU, and featured at least, I don't know, 85 to 100 posters and 200, 250 people. Uh, it was really spectacular because it was like a small day mop meeting. Anyway, um, so that's where I'll end and uh, turn it over to Rick.